In this episode, we're going to get the impressions from two Ursa Mini Pro shooters on the Ursa Mini Pro. In this episode, we're really lucky to have my brother, Kerry Judd, here with us. Kerry is a video shooter, does a lot of music videos, mm -hmm. does a real estate video, mm -hmm. um, and other kind of human interest pieces as well mm -hmm. on a number of occasions. You've been shooting with Yersa Mini Pro for... Mm, six months. Six months? Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I've been shooting with it for about nine months now, I think. Yeah. Um, overall, I think the reason I wanted to come back and do this is I had... we. I had an episode a while back with my friend Jacob Fenn who bought a C200 and we were going to kind of compare and contrast the workflow on those two cameras. And we ended up talking a lot more about the C200 and people were a little, little disappointed <laughs> and people said, hey, why have you not done a review of your Mini Pro? So that's kind of what we're doing here. We're just going to talk impressions. I think a lot of other reviews have been put out already. Um, really going to get the practical impressions and experience that we've had with that camera. So why don't we go to you first? What are some of the pros from your point of view on the Ursa Mini Pro? Um, so I, I like, uh, it's it's a bigger camera. It's not necessarily a run and gun, but the, the ergonomics, it's it's mentioned in a lot of reviews, I'm sure, but having your ISO and uh, you know certain controls that are just there right there at the flip of a switch as opposed to going through like a bunch of menus. And yep. um, I, the, the main thing that drew me to it was you got yours, mm -hmm. you came by the studio, I saw that log footage that we pull on the computer and I was like blown away because I've worked on some, you know, TV commercial type things where there is, you know, um, uh, Alexa's, mm -hmm. um, yeah, pretty much they were all Alexa's <laughs> <laughs> and the, uh, and that, that log image looked so similar to the area that I was, I was so confused by that. Cause it's, you know, this is a, an inexpensive working man's camera. Mm -hmm. And that was when the, the switch flipped and I was like, I gotta have this. And it comes down to the image for me. Okay. And, and I think it's important to say here too, when we say our working man camera, this is a cheap camera for a cinema camera. It's not necessarily a cheap camera for someone who's used to shooting on a $500 Panasonic, you right. know, G7 or whatever. Right. But, but just to keep it all in perspective, this is a very inexpensive camera for, as far as cinema is concerned. Sure. Yeah. And the, the brain for this camera is $6,000, yeah. whereas an Alexa Mini XT probably starts at $40,000, right. you know? And uh, for me, that was my whole paradigm of what could be done was changed and i think it's a great camera for people that are shooting dslrs on their you know gh4 gh5s their sony's um it's it's a very obvious at least to me was a very obvious um step up into a cinema camera okay cool so it, in terms of the log footage um what was it about that my, my sense is that it has large large part to do with the dynamic range is one big mm -hmm. piece of it um another part is the highlight roll off is not quite Alexa, but it's pretty close, yeah. way closer than I would say, you know, a lot of DSLRs or sure. mirrorless cameras. Is, was there something else about it too? I don't know. I, you just show me that footage and I went blind. <laughs> <laughs> and and there, there is something big about that. So yeah, I definitely agree. I think the image is beautiful. Mm -hmm. I think the controls are invaluable. Um, it's a really just, even, even when you do have to go in the menus, the menus are pretty straightforward. Great menus. It's easier to use than my GH4 or my Nikon D750, yeah. I think as far as doing video. Yeah. And that, that's another another point with it being a step up camera for DSLR shooters. Mm -hmm. the, one of the really cool things is the native mounts. You can have your EF mount, PL, uh, Nikon F mount. Yep. Um, I think yep. there's one other one too. There's a broadcast. Yeah, broadcast. Yep. Yeah, so you have all those options. So you don't, because when you get a new camera, obviously you're gonna need all the components that that put it together. But if you're a Canon shooter, it comes standard with an EF mount, and all your lenses already work. Yeah, yeah, it's brilliant. Okay. Um, let's talk about another thing that I guess a lot of people mention is the ND filters. I found those immensely helpful. Not having to bring external ND filters and screw them on and get everything set up. It's just nice to be took and you're yep. and you're good to go outdoors. Yep. And coming from DSLR shooting, having that and not having to go and stop and do that and just be like flip, we're good, we're good to go. It's it it adds a it adds a running gun quality even though you're working with a bigger camera, yep. which I think is awesome. Yep. Um, and I think that matters too, from a practical standpoint, when you get out on set, it, you don't have time. You, any way you can save time is really helpful because then you don't pull yourself out of the creative process yeah. and it makes a big difference. And I think like even just setting up for this one, we're doing a three camera shoot here today. Mm -hmm. How long do you think it took us to set up? 20 minutes and we were kind of dinking around as mom would say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right. Um, one thing we do have to talk about, customer service. So I have, on my side, I have a couple things that have not been perfect, but um, tell us about your experience, which is kind of a con, and then there's also a pro here too. Okay. Do I want to tell the whole? Tell the whole story. Okay. So I got my... Uh... I got my ump, as I call it for short. I don't know if that's a standard thing. And uh, I'd had it maybe three or four months, mm-hmm. and I got something that I refer to as pink screen. I went through all the forums to see what was causing pink screen. I didn't find it anywhere. Mm-hmm. No one had complained about this, and it was literally the screen was just going pink. And I think it was actually something with the image sensor. Got a hold of Blackmagic. They said, do a firmware update. I did it. It seemed to work for maybe a couple more weeks, and then I got the pink screen again. Hit them up. They said send it back right away, okay. and they just RMA it. They sent me a brand new one, okay. which was awesome. And that was it was where it was a little bit emotional for me because this is probably the most I'd ever spent on a camera, yeah. and I was loving it and I was doing so much with it um, to even have it with not have it for a week was was tough. And the second one, there was a known issue with uh, the screen will flutter, and I think they've actually issued a recall on that. Okay. And so I got that, and I just kept the same email thread from the first time. And the guy said, we're just going to overnight it here, and we're going to either fix it or we're sending you a new one like tomorrow. So I was only without my camera for two days. And they were super pleasant. They weren't. They didn't, they didn't treat you like an idiot, like, we well, didn't do the software update. Or do you know where, do, you know, like, when, you right. know, like when, when the IT guys joke about, like, okay, did you plug the computer in? Right. Did you reboot it? Like, <laughs> they, they were really, really great about it. And um um, and they were really fast to respond. So that, okay. that means a lot to me is because I hear horror stories about certain brands where once it doesn't work, you might as well just throw it in the garbage because it's going to be, they're not gonna you're not going to hear from them. Yeah. Okay. So that's kind of a pro and a con. I, I would yeah. say on mine, I, as far as I'm aware, I don't have, I've not had any hardware issues. So mine's yeah. been solid that way. But, um, and I don't, I think this is something you have not experienced, but when I go to play back a file mm-hmm. uh, and then I come back to record mode, sometimes it will freeze up. Yeah. And so I have to turn the camera off and back on. It's only shown up with the most recent firmware for whatever reason. Um, and I don't know what it is. So it doesn't seem like a hardware issue, hmm. but it, I haven't been able to explain it. So um, I've noticed since I put the SSD recorder on the back, it hasn't done it as much, which is weird. Because I know the latest update, that was one of the big things they added to the firmware was the support for the SSD, re- SSD recorder. So I don't know. Um, so it's not perfect, but I... Overall, that's the only issue I've had with it. So yeah. again, pros and cons there. Yeah. All right. Um, what about, uh, let's talk about Codex for a minute here. Yeah. How do you feel about the Codex that it's, are offered here? It's awesome. It's like awesome to have ProRes to be able to do raw and just mm-hmm. flip the switch. Um, you got, you just mentioned the SSD, the SSD recorder and CFast cards. CFast cards, obviously, you could buy the SSD recorder for the rise of some <laughs> CFast cards. Which um, I'll probably go to, but I think I think you need a dual CFast cards if you want to do like sixty frames raw lossless right. that kind of thing, which is very specialized. You're probably not going to do a lot of that. Mm-hmm. Um, so that well, the SSD is uh, three ninety five retail, I think. I think for the recorder, yeah. Yeah, and then just like get an SSD card in there, and you're pretty good to go. Yeah. Um, unless you're doing any of that weird stuff. Okay. Yep. I do like the the ProRes workflow is amazing. I think if you're working on a Mac, it um, because the four point six K footage just plays right back. It's like yeah. it's like nothing, so no yeah. big deal. Um, and yeah, they're large, but they you can go all the way down to ProRes LT, so you can get this kind of, um, or is it ProRes Proxy, I think you can go to. Yeah, you so can go to Proxy. To Proxy, so you can get really small files if you need to do that, um, but you can also go all the way up to, um, I don't even remember what the late, latest one's called, there's a four by four, but there's also another one too. Um, in any case, you can get almost everything, and it's, it's really easy to work with. Now, if you do shoot raw, um, and you work with DaVinci Resolve, that's a pretty good workflow as well. But if you're not a DaVinci Resolve user, I've heard people complain about, hey, this is, you know, what kind of a workflow is this? Because if you're gonna be cutting in something else, you have to bring it into Resolve first, kind of essentially export it as a ProRes or something else, and then bring it into your other editor. But, you know, I, I think <clears throat> if, and I'm actually moving a little bit closer toward this where I'm doing almost, I'm doing more of my work in Resolve now. Mm-hmm. Like even I've done some editing and the editor's a little bit funky from what I'm used to using, but it's it's getting better pretty quickly. Yeah. Well, and, and I think the what you're describing is also a huge pro. Every film in Hollywood that you watch mm-hmm. is not colored in Adobe or on the color board in Final Cut. It's colored in Resolve. So that brings us to another pro that you get the full version, yeah. the dongle with your camera. Good point. And, um, and I am actually starting to migrate into just doing everything in Resolve. It's just a matter. It, it does slow you down a little bit because you don't know where all the controls are. It does have some defaults where you can have your Final Cut or Premiere hotkeys yep. um, 
uh, in place, which helps. Um, but the, the color control you can get in Resolve is, I mean, that's that's worth its weight in gold. Yeah, it's amazing. It is amazing. And um, I think another thing that's nice too is I, I'm always bugged by dongles. Yeah. But I think the latest versions, you don't have dongles. You just have a license number, which, oh, cool. is, which is awesome. Nice. So too bad for us, but good for everybody yeah. else. <laughs> um, 4.6K. It's useful. Yep. Um, I, do, I deliver everything in 1080 still. Um, it's nice to, with a client, being able to say we shoot in 4K. Mm -hmm. A lot of them don't know the difference unless you educate them. Uh, you have that image area that you can you know move around in or squash down for color density or whatever. Yep. Yep. Um, and uh, having 4.6K, it's beautiful. It's, it's beautiful. Um, I don't think there's, there's a lot of, you know, there's a whole counting Ks debate and um, it depends on the quality of the Ks and these are good quality Ks. Yep. And uh, it, I don't know, I, I, I uh, am fumbling now, so. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm with you, it's just beautiful. It works, it works beautifully. I have noticed in some cases there is some more A, um, but you're gonna get that with, well, yeah, but here's where I get the haters. <laughs> some cameras don't have a lot of issues with moiré. Um, this one does have some, but it's not blurring. It's like uh, I, it'll be interesting to see if this shirt has any issues with it or not. Yeah, but a, it could be. Good example, um, probably the burlap on the burlap side. could might, might potentially. Um, I definitely, when I'm shooting screens for you know in pieces where I have to do that every once in a while, I get some. But um, you know, if you know what you're looking for and you know how to work around it, it's it's a reality. I think the physical build on the cameras is really pretty solid. Like yeah. it's an, I think it's a, I don't know if it's a magnesium alloy or, or what it is, yeah, but it's it is. it's something really nice and it's a tough camera. Yeah. Yeah, and before it's rigged out, it's not super heavy. I mean, you're looking at about six pounds. Yeah. You're probably looking at double that by the time you've put your whole kit together, but. Yeah. Um, also, we talked about the mounts a little bit. So yeah, you've got mount, you've got mount options. If, if uh, <laughs> In fact, I finally decided to go with some EF lenses. I've been shooting with Nikon lenses for the longest time. Um, Blackmagic was a little bit slow to come out with the Nikon mount. I think it just now hit. It's December 2017 right now. When they originally launched it, they said it would be available summer. Um, it was Australian summer. That's what it was. <laughs> That's what it was. We just get confused right. over here on this side of the pond. On so. this side of the pond, we just get completely confused. <laughs> yeah, I was annoyed with that for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, but we've learned to adapt, and it's, it's doing just fine. Literally, All right. literally adapt. Literally adapt. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't need an expensive adapter with glass in it. It's literally yeah. just a little yeah. metal ring. They're, they're less than 30 bucks or whatever. All right, we talked. Uh, let's talk about a couple of cons. Um, for those of you coming from mirrorless cameras or DSLRs, this is not a light camera. It's not a mini, um, even though it has the name mini in the right. name. Yeah. But it is mini relative to uh, some other... To the Ursa full size, <laughs> yeah, it's me compared to that. I mean, it falls in the range of like a, like an FS seven hundred or maybe like a uh, maybe it's a little bigger. Is it's, it a little I bigger? Think it's actually a little bigger. It is a little on the bigger side. I think yeah. it's actually unless you get up into an Alexa or something like yeah. that, it's bigger than pretty much everything. I was going to say same. Alexa Mini might be a pretty fair weight comparison. Maybe, yeah, maybe it's, I don't know. It's not, but it's not small. So if you're looking for something small, if you're looking for something you can fly on a gimbal, this uh -huh. may not be the right choice really. yeah that was that was a hang-up because i've been looking at different uh gimbals the ronin m ronin mx the ronin one full size mm -hmm. none of them would do it would hold it without certain modifications right. that i wasn't necessarily comfortable doing mm -hmm. um i haven't seen anything come out i've i've heard so i don't have any authoritative definitive information on this the ronin two will hold it it's kind of hard to pill, pill to swallow though to buy a gimbal that costs as much as your camera. Right. So I haven't done it yet. I'm, I'm just happy with my Glide Cam, steady cam, put it on a vest and it's not too bad. Yeah, okay, yep, same here. So I think that's gonna be a challenge. But again, when I'm flying on a gimbal, I'll usually pull out the smaller camera. That's where the, the Panasonic GH5 yeah. or four or whatever is actually a pretty good choice. Here are a couple funky things from me uh, as far as cons. And I think they're things that they can actually address in firmware. Number one, I love false color, um, but it would be really nice to have a false color scale actually on the screen, just so you know. Huge. I mean, it'd it'd be really make it nice so much more useful right away. Yeah, exactly. And then as far as kind of the default exposure tool they put on the screen is a histogram. That's okay. You know, generally I can get where I need to go, but it's not as good of a tool as a waveform, a proper waveform monitor. So it'd be really nice to have a real waveform monitor on there as well. Now, I think what they're thinking is, you know, add their, um, 
what do they call it? They call it a studio viewfinder. It's actually a monitor. Yeah. And I think that probably, I don't even know if that has that on there. I assume it has a waveform of some I sort. It, I think it does. I think when we looked but at it last year, now that it, it had, did, yeah. I'm pretty sure. Um, but it'd be nice to be able to have that just on the camera without having to, to add that additional yeah. weight and size to it. So there's some things. All right, uh, just a couple of notes. These aren't necessarily something that will fall into the cons or the pros, but something to know that um, is just important. Number one, low light. Talk about low light. It's so yeah. It's not it's not a low light camera, and it's not it's not meant to be. So don't get disappointed when you're you know sitting around the kitchen table and you try it out for the first time. <laughs> this is a production camera. This is a cinema camera. If you're not lighting or planning what the light's going to be when you're going to shoot, mm -hmm. this isn't the camera you should be using anyway. You should right. be on your GH5 or Sony A7 or whatever it is that you like for low light. Yep. Yep. Um, I completely agree. And actually what I found too is if you if you light right, there's I'm not having noise issues, even for low key shots. If you expose it right, mm -hmm. it's just not it's just not really and you're gonna color grade it, it's not an issue. Yeah. It's, I, I haven't found it to be an issue at least. So um, one thing I will say is that if you and this took me, you know, I've had it for I think almost nine months. I pre ordered, so I got it right right as soon as it started shipping, but um, working with a log profile is a challenge. If you don't you have to invest some time and effort into learning how to work with it because it's not just a matter of shooting a log profile, coming into post, increasing, you know, pushing up the, you know, contrast and you know, saturation. Lift and gain and then adding contrast and adding saturation because the colors start to look like bubble gum and, and weird strange, stuff. Yeah. yeah. So what I've learned from my friend Jacob Fenn, who's a colorist, is that what you really need to do is you really have to use that the 3D LUT that ships with it. And um because what happens is there's some color transforms that need to take place. And they're not just linear transforms. It's not just a matter of grabbing the hue slider and moving it one way or the other. Um, that won't do it. So you actually have to do the uh, 3D LUT. And if when you do the 3D LUT, what's important too is you're going from the Blackmagic Film profile to a Rec. 709 profile. So the Rec. 709 pro profile has far fewer, far less latitude, less dynamic range. Right. And so things start to look really freaky at first, especially if you're used to exposing to the right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so what I found is you also have to expose right. You really have to keep those skin tones in the you know the forty to sixty IRE range. You can't you can't push them as far as to the right if you want if you're going to use this and expect it to just look great out of the camera. Right. And I think that's an important note for people. Like I said, this I feel like this is the step out of the DSLR world. Um, you're not just dropping your H two sixty four SD card in and then you know go and do that thing. You do need to um, gain a little bit of technical knowledge. And as you know. I tend to be like shooting from the hip, creative ideas, and like, yeah. why doesn't this look good? What's wrong with this camera? I don't understand. And so you do need to take a little bit of time to get to know the camera and understand what you see on the screen, how that's going to translate to your computer and when you edit it. Exactly. And just ex expect that if you're if you're like me, coming from DSLR into a cinema camera. All right. Uh, so I think those are some thoughts on the Blackmagic Ursa Mini Pro. Um, I hope that was helpful for people. It's not. Again, we're not here. We're not being endorsed by Blackmagic. We have no skin in that game. I mean, yeah. it's just the camera that we happen to use. We both like it. Yeah. I'm it's working for us. Yeah. Um, and those are some thoughts. So uh, thanks again. Yeah. And you people can find you where? In a cave somewhere. <laughs> uh, <on laughs> or, in, or in a wormhole. Yeah, or in a wormhole. Um, <laughs> yeah, so the wormhole on Facebook. Okay. Or just ask Curtis. I'm usually in there trolling your comments and fight, fighting back that anyone that puts them down. All right, thanks everybody. We'll talk to you again next week. Mm -hmm.